Straight ahead on 12 News, something to avoid. A startling number of deer vehicle crashes and what local cities are doing about it. Then, a program that works, helping to keep prescription drugs out of the wrong hands. But first, game over in the fight to save the Terrace Theater. 12 News starts right now. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us. The fight to save the Terrace Theater is over. And that's according to the group that battled in court to save the Robbinsdale landmark. And we get more from 12 News reporter Eric Nelson. It's a, it's a sad day. It's a difficult day. For Terrace Theater supporters, D-Day has arrived. It sounds pretty inevitable. With their appeals exhausted, Terrace backers grudgingly admitted that the theater will soon be demolished. The whole group was very disappointed. Terrace supporters could not come up with enough money to save the structure and have given up their fight with the city and developers. If you don't have millions of dollars, you just simply can't be in the game. The bonds that the court enacted, I mean, we just can't raise $6.375 million in four days. The Robbinsdale Historical Society is hoping to salvage letters from the terrace sign and chandeliers from the theater. I really don't think we're going to see anything. But aren't sure if that is going to happen. We were hoping that, that we would get that. Uh, we thought there would be at least a chance of getting the chandeliers, but now they've been whisked off to storage and we don't know where the storage is. For other Robbinsdale residents, the terrace teardown is good news. It's more than just a store, it's creating a better environment for our community. They welcome high V or whatever replaces the theater. Right now we have a huge eyesore that hasn't been anything for 17 plus years. Now it's time for uh, something better to come in. I understand they expect it'll produce about 700 new jobs and the people that live in this immediate area will have something nice to look at not a building that's slowly falling apart and growing trees out of the roof. When the terrace finally does come down, it won't end this saga. Now the question will be, what replaces it? In Robbinsdale, I'm Eric Nelson, Channel 12 News. Demolition, we're told, could begin as early as this evening, Friday evening. Meanwhile, friends of the Terrace announced that on November 5th, they will be hosting a Rock the Terrace concert at the Lodge in Robbinsdale as they celebrate the history of the theater. Meanwhile, the same developer for the Terrace Theater site is working on plans to develop a large section of the gravel mining area in Maple Grove. Inland Development Partners is proposing a 193,000 square foot office and manufacturing facility on a 13 acre site. Inland estimates the plan could create as many as 430 jobs. Maple Grove City Council could vote Monday whether to enter into a preliminary agreement with the developer. A serious accident closed down a Maple Grove intersection for several hours on Friday afternoon. State Patrol is reconstructing a two-car collision at Elm Creek Boulevard and County Road 81. The crash flipped one car on its roof. One driver suffered serious injuries and was airlifted to a hospital. Police hope to have that intersection open again by early Friday evening. Well, here's a scary thought. One in 80 Minnesota drivers will hit a deer this year. And in the next few months, the chances more than double. Local cities and the park district are trying to do something about it. It happens fast. This video from the Minnesota State Patrol shows how quickly a deer can come out of nowhere. If you're going at a high rate of speed, sometimes the, the animal can end up coming through the windshield into the car. Maple Grove has about 60 car versus deer accidents a year, and Detective Dominic Wareham, who organizes hunts to thin the population, says everybody knows someone who's hit a deer. It even happened to him. A trophy buck walked across the interstate right in front of me, and I did what you're not supposed to do. I hit my brakes and tried to swerve out of the way and uh, totaled my, my car. That's why trained archery hunters are called in to thin the deer population. In Maple Grove, they hunt only on private land. In Brooklyn Park, archery hunts start on Monday in the wooded areas of several city parks. So we were seeing a drastic uh, increase when we weren't managing our deer population of the number of uh, deer to vehicle incidents, and it becomes extremely dangerous. The numbers got as high as 105 collisions in 2011. By 2014, a smaller herd helped reduce collisions to 63. But when there was a poor hunt, those numbers went back up. We didn't take the number of deer that we targeted to take, and we saw the correlation in the increase in the number of incidents. 
Another issue is how many deer can the land support? That's why Three Rivers Parks conducts surveys from a helicopter. And from those surveys, we can tell that there's a very good population of deer within the urban areas. And for drivers, sometimes there's no choice. But when you drive can make a difference. Uh, I would say probably your twilight hours are the worst time of day. But really, it could happen at any time, and it's something for the drivers to be aware of. And in Brooklyn Park, officials say signs will be posted when those hunts are underway. Hennepin County officials say more folks are using these green medicine disposal boxes. The Brookdale location has collected over 1,800 pounds of unwanted medicine so far this year. And getting rid of old drugs is not only good for the environment, it keeps them out of the wrong hands. Keeping it out of the drinking water and uh, keeping it out of the landfills. Uh, and the second reason is for diversion purposes, which we want to keep it out of the medicine cabinets for possible abuse and poisonings by children and by even pets. The program started in 2012. Since that time, the county has destroyed over 73,000 pounds of medicine. There are five drop-off boxes located in the Northwest Metro. Some good news for anyone out there who plans on taking college classes next year. Beginning October 1st, students can now submit the free application for federal student aid, also known as the FAFSA. In the past, students had to wait until January 1st to fill out the form, but they needed the most recent W-2 information to complete it. Under the new system, students can fill out the form beginning this weekend while using information from their previous tax return. I'm pretty excited about it with my role of working with, with students is we can get that filed earlier. Um, they can start finding out about what their eligibility is for aid earlier and it doesn't put families in that tricky spot of having to estimate their taxes or feeling that time crunch of January, February. Counselors from Wayzata High School say the form can be filled out online and takes about 30 minutes to complete. Coming up, combining theater with nature. That's next in Weekend Showcase. And later in sports, Hopkins aims for another win over rival Wyzetta in a top 10 volleyball matchup. But first, no need to worry about rain to dampen plans. It should be a beautiful weekend. This weekend, you'll have the opportunity to meet two giants of American literature out in their own element. They'll be at the Eastman Nature Center along with a large cast of their friends. Neil Persley explains in today's Weekend Showcase. Mr. Emerson, a brilliant... Yeah, hold this! <laughs> of course. Well, I'm Henry Thoreau. You spoke at my graduation. Uh, Harvard? Yes. And? Oh, I, I wasn't there. If you had the chance to meet Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, would you do it? This weekend is your opportunity as Tiger Lion Arts presents Nature at Eastman Nature Center in Dayton. Within the play, there's this um, just beautiful human story about two friends and, and sort of a, a growing passion for nature and, and actually a fracturing in that friendship. So there's a lot of drama there. Do you mean to take writing seriously? Yes. Forbes is a direct descendant of Emerson and is a natural in the role. The play is a story within a story, looking at mankind's relationship to nature through the relationship of these two men who loved and revered nature and each other. This is really taking their ideas, dropping them into the environment from which they hatched, and igniting them. The entire play takes place outside in different areas and is called a walking play because the audience walks along with the cast from scene to scene. We will take them on this journey into the woods of Eastman and they're going to travel from these variety of different locations in the park. You're going to get a wonderful sense of what Eastman is like. You must know Walden Pond and I walk there almost every day. Thoreau was probably best known for his writing about the two years that he lived at Walden Pond. Bear Brummel plays Henry David Thoreau. And he wanted people to get back to nature and I think that is something so important nowadays as we spend so much time in front of a screen, in front of, you know, uh, in traffic. We spend all this time trying to get something, trying to do something trying to achieve something and I think Thoreau really wanted you to just experience something. The beautiful non-confines of the woods and grasslands at Eastman are perfect for just that. Let's take a walk then shall we? For we can take a son Neil Pursley 12 News. Join us! 
They take the leap. For a list of showtimes, go to our website. That's 12.tv. Well, coming up, some good deals on toys, games, and kids' clothing. But first, to look at the first half of the prep football season. John Jacobson has that and more coming up next in sports. The leaves are changing colors, so I guess it's no big surprise, but it's a little hard to believe we're already halfway through the football I know, season. I know, getting a little cooler on the Friday yeah. nights, but we'll have a nice night uh, tonight for week five. Local high school football teams start the second half of the regular season Friday night. Jay Wilcox takes a look at how things are shaping up so far. After one of the best years ever for football in the northwest suburbs last fall, many teams are finding the going a bit tougher in 2016. Many, but not all. Tatino Grace opened with a win over Eden Prairie and they haven't slowed down yet. The Eagles are giving up just eight points per game, although they should be tested by Blaine Friday night. The Cooper Hawks are also 4-0, proving they could overcome the loss of some talent from last season. Cooper scored more than 30 points in three of four games. Tough tests against De La Salle and Spring Lake Park are still ahead. Champlain Park's impressive win over Blaine last week has the Rebels sitting at 3-1 in their 25th anniversary season. A mighty test at Totino Grace looms next week. Maple Grove sits at 2-2 two two entering Friday night after starting 2-0. There's still time for the Crimson to make a run. A road test at Minnetonka next week will be a key. Defending 6A champ Osseo lost some great playmakers and their head coach from last season, and they've started 1-3. The, the uh, Orioles should be able to compete nice, well with the rest of the teams on their schedule. Wyzetta's also off to a 1-3 start after losing a lot to graduation, and the rest of the schedule isn't an easy path to recovery. Park Center had a big breakthrough a year ago at 8-3, but the Pirates are also finding the going tough at 1-3 this season. Armstrong has had a horrible string of injuries, but has managed a 2-2 two two start, which was almost even better, except for a last-minute loss to Cooper. Providence Academy is looking good at 3-1. Brooklyn Center started 0-2, but has won two straight. Can't wait to see what the second half of the season brings. Jay Wilcox, 12 Sports. And tonight on 12 Sports, it's Wyzetta at Maple Grove live on Channel 12 starting at 7 o'clock. Wyzetta and Hopkins are both ranked in the top 10 in Class 3A Volleyball. Second time these teams have played this fall came Thursday night. Royals looking for the season sweep. They get a point here to lead 23-18. And they win it 25-18 over the Trojans. Second set and Wyzetta will or Hopkins rather will jump out to a big lead this point will make it 17 8 Hopkins wins the first set by a score of 25 18 then the second set by a score of 25 20 Royals complete the sweep they win the third set 25 15 another big win for Hopkins. It's really a big deal because um, last year we didn't do so well against in conference matches. So this year it's really fun that we're having success and doing well. It's a tight race for the girls soccer championship in the Lake Conference. Why is that a beat Hopkins one nothing just two weeks ago? But the Trojans had lost to both Minnetonka and Edina since. Trojans looking to get back on track Thursday against the Royals. Wyzetta will score first in this match. Off the throw in, the ball to flex off the Hopkins keeper right to Eva Brewer who scores. And Wyzetta lays it one to nothing. Later in the first half, a perfect pass by Hopkins ahead to Lavin Douglas. She'll get behind the Wyzetta defense and puts this one away, evening the game up at one. And that's the score at halftime as well. Second half, Morgan Turner gets a penalty kick for Wyzetta and she delivers. Nice placement. Netting her team high 12th goal of the season. It's 2 1 Wyzetta. Turner will pick up an assist on the final goal of the match, passing to Emily Dillon for the goal. Wyzetta goes on and they beat Hopkins by a final score of 3 to 1. Wyzetta boys' soccer team is still undefeated and they showed why against Hopkins. An unusual matchup, Wyzetta's Patrick Weah going up against his brother Clarence Weah of Hopkins. Highlights from this one, Wyzetta getting on the board, passes chipped ahead, McLean King scores, and it's 1-0 Trojans at halftime. Second half, Patrick Weah will sneak a shot through the Royals' Sam Eklund, who came in for the injured goalie Ryan St. Clair, and it's 2-0. Walter Smith delivers the long ball, Weah waits for the bounce, and Shields off the defender to score for a 3-0 lead. Wyzetta well, adds two more on the way to a 5-0 win. Regular season wraps up, Mike, in uh, 
high school soccer next week already. Some good shots in that last yes, one. Yeah, well. Wow. Thank you. In local vote 2016, two more candidates running for the Osseo City Council. And all four people are running for two seats on the council, including incumbent Harold Johnson and Kerry Keene. I am Harold E. Johnson for re-election to the Osseo City Council. I have been a property and business owner for nearly 60 years in the Osseo area. This long time knowledge is helpful at the council level as my having been a CPA working with many businesses and individuals. Osseo has its own full time police force and volunteer fire departments, which individuals and businesses appreciate their fine work. Osseo has a long-term plan in place for management of all of the facilities of the city in order to not overburden individual taxpayers. Care is taken to operate the city in a fashion to provide services necessary with the least tax as possible. Your consideration and vote will be appreciated. I'm Carrie Keene and I'm running for Osseo City Council. I've lived in Osseo for 10 years and I am running for City Council because I want to be the voice of residents. It is important to me to listen to residents and to vote according to their needs. I will work to preserve and support Osseo's small town atmosphere by supporting families, local and small businesses, and work to make this city a destination for visitors. I will keep this city fiscally responsible not only to itself but more importantly to the residents and I will work to reduce the burden of special assessments on homeowners. I will use my experience in project and construction management to fully assess initiatives and projects, their risks and returns on investments to ensure that we are making the best and most informed decisions. I look forward to representing you. Please vote for me, Carrie Keene, at the November 8th election. And on Monday, we will start hearing from the many candidates running for Osseo's school board. Still ahead, getting an early lesson in commerce at a garage sale for kids. We'll be right back. Well, finally, are you in the market for a stuffed toy or video game? The annual kids garage sale takes place on Saturday. The event takes place at the Crystal Community Center. And on Friday, folks were setting up tables for the event. It costs $10 for children ages 6 to 15 to rent a table. And the kids' garage sale is a way to get rid of unwanted toys, books, and other items while making some money at the same time. They price the items themselves, and then uh, they come and they rent a table here at the community center and, and set it up the way they'd like, and then sell their items throughout the morning. The kids' garage sale is put on by the Crystal New Hope and Robbinsdale Recreation Departments, and they're hoping to get a big group of buyers there tomorrow. That's it for now. Thanks for joining us. We will see you back here again Monday starting at 4.